So, uh, to talk about the fish will be Tony Brown. He's a policy advisor to the EFDP group in the European Parliament. Um, the slightly suspect part of it is that he's also been an advisor to the European Commission. <laughs> so, but anyway, he is no longer that, and he knows everything there is to know about the fish. So, Tony Brown, please. Thank you. Um, I listened to Michael with absolute fascination. Um, in part because my degrees are in history, and listening to him was how it must have been to listen to a chartist in the 19th century, or, or um, uh, something similar. A brilliant exposition from a left-wing point of view of the case against the European Union. And as I was listening to him, I looked at my own appearance, and I knew what was written about my background, and I thought, God, I'm one of those bosses that he hates so much. And actually my track record sort of confirms that, because I have been a member of both the Tory party and UKIP. I have been a European parliamentary candidate for both the Tory party and for UKIP. And I've been an advisor to the European Commission. And I've been an advisor to European firms, or cooperatives in fact, on European policy issues. So for instance, I advised the Danish milk cooperative, Meierauskabat Denmark, on their approach to common agricultural policy back in the 1990s, at the time that the quotas that uh, Stuart was talking about were being introduced. And now I advise Stuart. So I feel a little bit like a gamekeeper turned poacher. Uh, but that's quite deliberate on my part, because as far as I am concerned, I am here simply to state facts. They are facts about the way the EU operates, and they are facts about the consequences of the way the EU operates. And I do not regard my uh, speech, my remarks, as a matter of opinion. I regard them as statements of fact. Now, you will find most of those facts set out in this booklet. It doesn't bear my name, it bears the name of Ray Finch, who's one of Stuart's colleagues, and who I also advise in the European Parliament. But you will find my name in the acknowledgements at the back. And we produced this book in order to expose the consequences for Britain, but actually beyond Britain, of the common fisheries policy. Now, if ever there is a single example of a bad policy which has got worse over the years as a consequence of their attempts to try to solve how bad that policy was, it is the common fisheries policy. And some copies of this have been distributed amongst you, but equally, uh, I gave it to Sharon as a PDF, and for all of you that have internet access, you should have it as a PDF, and I strongly, strongly recommend that you all simply read it, because it gives all the nuts and bolts, all the detail of what I'm going to try and present, present to you uh, in brief outline. Now, if you think about it, on land, the effect of property rights is to enable people to think about the future. The whole basis of the origin of farming is that you set aside enough seeds or product so that you can breed for the future. And the problem at sea is because you have no property rights, nobody thinks of the future. And all you hear about the problem of sustainability of fisheries policy and all the rest of it comes out of that single, simple issue. When Stuart decides what to do this year, he is thinking about whether he will have enough stock, enough seed, not merely for next year, but for 10 years off. 
the way the fish, the seas are fish, remains actually in a sort of pre-farming age. Boats go to sea, they are ever larger, they have ever larger nets, they're ever bigger, and they simply hoover up the fish in the sea, and they hoover up uh, the breeding stock for next year, the year after, etc. So the issue for any fisheries policy is how you make it sustainable by ensuring that there is enough breeding stock for there to be a future, for there to be enough cod or whatever. And um, the effect of industrialization in the 19th century, amongst other things, was actually to give them an efficiency in catching fish, which has depleted world stocks to the point where what used to be the stuff of, of legend, you know, the Newfoundland cod banks, they aren't there anymore. Because all, including the breeding stock for the future, has been caught and that is one of the reasons why you're finding ever more obscure and different species in the supermarket counter or the fishmonger. Now, if you understand that problem, what you need is a policy which enables you to have enough fish for today and have enough fish for tomorrow, next week and next millennium. Now, what the European Union did just before we joined was to collectivise the waters. Now, what that means <laughs> is that there is no such thing, literally no such thing, as British waters anymore. Or indeed Irish waters, or Danish waters, or Swedish waters. I don't want to be uh, nationalistic about this. And they are collectivised. Now, that is a bad thing to do because it removes the incentive for nation states to think about how many fish there will be for tomorrow and next decade. What they then did was they basically introduced a, a, a subsidy system and eventually a quota system. Now, the quota system was the bureaucratic response to the problem that I've already outlined. You say that you are catching too many fish, so we will limit the number that you can catch, and that will ensure that there are enough fish in the sea to breed for the future. It sounds good on paper. Forgive me, in practice, it's utter bollocks. <laughs> and the reason it is utter bollocks, because it ignores human nature. It ignores, in fact, some of the aspects that Michael was talking about. Because people cheat. Um, they... The, what this describes is a system by which the French and Spanish are paid to build their ships. And I call them ships deliberately. You have a romantic image of the fishing boat and the small... Fish. They're not like that. They are massive factory ships with nets which extend for miles. And they pull in everything that they can and they stick it in their ship. Now, um, the French and the Spanish, other people as well, but it's particularly the French and the Spanish, they are subsidised to build the boats. They are subsidised to take the boats to sea in the form of a fuel subsidy. They are subsidised to sit in harbour on the grounds that they are catching too many fish. They are subsidised to scrap the boats, 
And when they do scrap them, rather than taking the tonnage out, they build ever larger, more efficient ships, which are also subsidised, in order to hoover ever more fish out of the sea. Now, the response to this was to introduce a quota system. And it sounds, as I've said, quite good on paper. But they cheat. Not only do they cheat, they don't care about the rules. I mean, it used to be said, I'm not sure whether it's accurate, that the uh, Spanish um, uh, fishing and marine inspectorate consisted of two guys in Madrid in the, uh, in the middle of Spain. Um, they had to travel for half a day in order to get to the seaside. Um, uh, because, as, as some of you may know, the Spanish fishing region is a region called Galicia. And Stuart and I, Stuart was on the fisheries committees for a while, Stuart and I watch the MEPs from Galicia acting as the lobbying front for Galician fishermen. They don't think about the future. They don't think about fairness. All they are concerned to ensure is that the Spanish fishermen that elect them will go on voting for them because they structure the system in order to suit the Spanish and the French fishermen. Now, quotas don't work because, amongst other things, they cause people to discard perfectly good fish back into the sea. And you'll have heard of quotas and you'll have heard of discards. And again, when you are discarding from a very small boat, there may be a small chance that the fish is still alive when it's thrown back. There's absolutely no chance from a fishing factory ship. So what you are doing is you are throwing perfectly good dead fish back in the sea to provide food for seagulls. And that is one of the reasons why you will see the famous pictures of the fishing boat with all the seagulls behind it. Now, they are aware that... Um, the quota system has all these damaging effects. And therefore, they have introduced what is called a landing obligation. Now, the thing I want to try to communicate to you today is that everything the EU does is a bureaucratic response to a problem it itself has created. And the real answer for me to Michael's question as to why I, with my appearance and background, uh, am standing up here today is because I genuinely believe that the traditional British and English way of doing things are much better than the European Union way of doing the things. Be worse, <laughs> and, and therefore, that being in the EU is a long-term disaster. Now, what is wrong with the landing obligation? Well, the first thing is, and um, Stuart's already sort of made reference to this in relation to agricultural policy, the more complex rules you introduce, the more bureaucracy you have to introduce to see whether it's being done as it should be, but the more you are incentivizing people to cheat. It's known as the doctrine of the perverse incentive. The more complicated you make the bureaucracy, the more rules you introduce, the more you ensure that ordinary, decent people are motivated to cheat, and that is what the landing obligation is going to do. Now, my conclusion from all of this is couldn't be simpler. The common fisheries policy, as outlined here, is an environmental disaster. It is a disaster for sustainability. It is a disaster for the future. 
it also encourages criminality and it is unreformable. And this is the last point. I have, in fact, um, uh, tangled, uh, argued with um, uh, certain ECR Tory MEPs who want to stay in because they claim, oh, well, Tony, even if everything you say is accurate, it can be reformed. Yeah. It can be reformed for me. Well, look, you know, the definition of madness is banging your head against a brick wall and expecting it constantly and expecting a different result. They have been failing to uh, reform the common fisheries policy in a sensible, usable way for 40 years. If they can't get it right in the first 40 years, what reason is there to think that they are going to get it right in the next 40? It, it's just, it's insane. Now, the main challenge you will hear is twofold. You will hear, well, it can always be reformed. Well, technically, there is a process by which it can be changed, but nothing they have done so far has made it better. And just applying a little bit of simple logic, if you haven't made something better in 40, 50 years, why do you suppose that they are going to make it better now? And actually, all the changes, which have been put in place in the last couple of years, at the end of the last parliament, the reformed common fisheries policy, they don't change any of the fundamentals that I have tried to describe to you today. And the reason in practice it's unreformable comes back to what I've already told you. The fisheries committee is stuffed full of representatives from Spanish Galicia. It's stuffed full of representatives from France around Brest. The EPP, the Christian Democrats, and the Social Democrats, who call themselves socialists but aren't, they operate a stitch-up. And that stitch-up ensures that the sensible ideas which we might produce, or the Swedes might produce, or the Danes might produce, don't in practice stand an earthly chance of being put into effect because the system is rigged in favour of the people who benefit from it. So that's the, I, I hope I've dealt with the first issue. Now the other one, um, Sharon was uh, good enough to send me this as a question. But what about all those international agreements? Well, this is, this is a game where the advocates of membership are misleading you to the point of lying. Norway is not in the European Union. Norway's fishing industry is massively important to it. Iceland is not in the European Union. Iceland's fishing industry is massively important to it. Do you think that Iceland and Norway would stay out of the European Union if it were going to endanger such an important sector to them as their fishing industries? Of course they wouldn't. And the simple answer to the question, what about all the international agreements, is if Norway can do it and Iceland can do it, I am absolutely certain that the 60, or is it 77 million people of the United Kingdom can do it. And in fact, it's worse than that, because by being in the European Union, we are deprived of a voice on all sorts of key international bodies. We don't have a voice on the World Trade Organization anymore. Iceland does, and Norway does. I 
think even Liechtenstein does. <laughs> but we don't, because we have to do it through the European Union. Actually, the same applies to other less well-known organisations, like the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organisation. And this little booklet finishes by pointing out, by staying out of the EU, Norway is able to have its own seat and voice on key international committees, including the World Trade Organization, the Food and Agricultural Organization, and its Fisheries Committee. Just incidentally, my, um, my work on this policy area has suggested to me that the Fisheries Committee of the FAO is practically run by Norway. They seem to have a permanent chairmanship of it, <laughs> and they seem to control whatever happens. So this idea that you have to be part of the European Union to be part of international agreements, it's absolute nonsense. And the only way, the only way we can get our waters back and enforce, introduce a sensible approach to their fishing, which thinks of the future, is by Brexit, by leaving the European Union. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, good with some facts. Now, I'm happy to take a few questions on clarifying issues. I do not want political questions now. I've said that before. Okay, we take that uh, at the last session. But can I also just say before we start that the pamphlet uh, that Tony was referring to there is on the um, optional reading list that you have all been sent by email. You just click on it and you get on to, to uh, a website where you can, you, you can read it because I did it this morning. So you can do that. Uh, and the second thing is you've got the piece of paper on the, uh, behind the agenda. Write the question or questions that you want to have answered in the last session and hand it in to either Sharon or Laura and then we'll do that. I think it was Brian first and then... Yeah, well, thanks for that, that's excellent. The, what, what, there's one thing that used to be talked about a lot and it's not talked about so much now is the status of food mountains in the European Union. Uh, and I, 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 I used to hear about them a lot, the rice mountains and all that. And you don't hear about them much and I think it'd be a quite important issue to, to hit them with. Well, I hope I told you about that uh, when the big change in 1992, uh, when they stopped having an intervention system that was very generous, so that um, it, it was a market for farmers, and and if, if anyone in the trade wanted to buy wheat, they had to offer above the intervention price to get it. And when there were surpluses, uh, the trade didn't want it, they, so they either dumped the surplus overseas and export refund subsidies, or they put it into an intervention store, and that was your uh, wine lakes and butter oh, But well, that I'm changed. Sorry about the status of now. Are yeah, they? well, that changed yeah. in 1992. Mm. They got rid of an intervention system which offered a profitable price, and they were limited to what they could could be put into it. So slowly, they sold out this, the stocks and didn't replenish them. So we don't have these enormous quantities. Some people say, no, they're obscene, but actually, I think a quantity of food isn't really obscene if it kept in good conditions, but it, 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 it was, too, there was too much. It, it encouraged production when production didn't need to be encouraged. So they have gone. Okay, so we actually drunk the wine list. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gentlemen <laughs> down there. Interesting fact worth noting, but Norway's fishing ex industry over the last 30 or 40 years has expanded fivefold, it's grown fivefold, and it now exports a fishing surplus to the EU. Whereas Britain is, is contracted dramatically, 100,000 job loss. We import fish caught in its own waters. That's just a statement of the fact. Just a quick question. Acquired rights in international law. Common fisheries policy, obviously, is part of the EU and all the international agreements. But isn't it the case that acquired rights position in international law would still come into force? So a lot of the arrangements that we're currently under, at least for a period of time, will be rather the same even if we've left. Um, I fear that you are right. But there is a simple point. If you look at every development that has taken place, uh, 
sorry to use the phrase, but there isn't a, a, there isn't a, a, a better one. Every development that takes place within the EU is sui generis. That means it is of its own kind, it is unique. And therefore, where I, I think you are right, because there would have to be a transition period. And one of the discussions that I've uh, had with various people is about some of the detail of how you work through the transition period. I'm not going to bore you with that now. But in the longer term, the only way that we can get our water back, <coughs> not merely the water itself, but actually the seabed and what's under the seabed, is by leaving the European Union. And we can get them back. And um, the international law basis, you're, some of you will have noticed that Russia has been exploring into the Arctic Ocean as the ice cap retreats. Now that is Putin being quite clever under the uh, legal terms that you are referring to. But basically, what the law of the sea says is that if you are a sovereign state, you have what's called an EZ, an exclusive economic zone, up to 200 nautical miles from your shore, or the median line between you and somebody else's zone, because you get stupid comments like, well, that would mean that Gibraltar had uh, fishing rights in the Sahara Desert. And of course it doesn't. That's just stupid. But, so it's, 200, it's a 200 mile EEZ or the median line and our position within UKIP is that we simply want to restore Britain's control up to the 200 mile internationally agreed EEZ which uh, is the, the basic position. There would need to be a transition period. I, 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 you call them quiet rights, I often call them grandfather rights. Um, but they're the same thing, you have to negotiate it. And incidentally, uh, I, I am just occasionally asked where I think the next major war will be. And I say, look at what is happening over the Spratlys in the South China Sea, look at Chinese territorial claims in that area and Chinese behavior. And it is a very interesting um, uh, side development in relation to everything that your question is referring to. All right, I'll take one more question. I think it was Hugo that was there first. So last question, then we'll take the chief. Thanks, very quick question on fisheries. Um, what is the tonnage of um, Norwegian fish that land every year and the tonnage of UK fish um, every year? So I just see a comparison of the industry. I don't know off the top of my head. And that gentleman who just asked the previous question sounds better qualified to answer than I am. I know a link where it is somewhere, but I think that would really help because you know, the fishing industries and the amount of space is similar. So you've got the answer. Thank you very much.